Thank you, Judy, for your introduction and your kind words, and to all of you for your presence here today. I feel extremely grateful to Radcliffe and the Harvard Scholar at Risk program for giving me the opportunity to find an intellectual sanctuary where I can feel safe. I feel truly honored to be here and being able to share with you my concerns about the fight against corruption and the future of my country. When I was studying to become a lawyer in Guatemala, I dreamed that someday I will be able to do a postgraduate studies in a foreign country. But never in my wildest dreams I imagined that one day I will be a scholar at Harvard. So being a fellow at Radcliffe makes me feel that life has been very generous to me. For a Guatemalan woman, having a college degree is a great achievement, since the opportunities to go to university are very limited. Only 2% of the population is able to go to university, and a fraction obtains a degree. So I consider myself extremely privileged for the learning opportunities that I have had. Serving my country as a judge was the best way to show my appreciation for that privilege. Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. He argued that education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine that the child of farmer's worker can become the president of a great nation. It is what we make out of what we have, not what we are given that separates one person from another. I do believe that if you have the opportunity to grow and develop your skills, you also have the responsibility with your community to contribute to build a better country, so others can have the same opportunities th that I had. During this presentation, I will give you some highlights and general information about Guatemala. Then I will present some facts about the judicial system and the role of the International Commission Against Impunity, known as CICIG. At last, I will address the challenges that my country faced in order to become a true democracy. Located at the center of the American continent, Guatemala has a strategic location for business and exchange of goods. It is known as the country of eternal spring, since the weather is 70 degrees all year round in the central region. It is the perfect land for growing any kind of crops, since there is, there is a variety of microclimes. There is also beautiful scenery. Guatemala has a wide, diverse, and multicultural population. It is one of the countries in the region with one of the largest assessment of ethnic groups. Most of them are descendants of the Mayans. Each community has its own custom and languages. In Guatemala, there are 24 different spoken languages in total. We have a rich history, great archaeological sites, and many beautiful places to visit. If we didn't have security problems, Guatemala could sustain itself just with the tourism industry. It could be the perfect place for any kind of vacation or to relax. But despite its beauty, Guatemala is one of the most violent countries in the region. Last year, the rate of murders was 30 per cent, sorry, 35 per 100,000 inhabitants. The level of impunity is 98%. So as all you can imagine, it is really a paradise for criminal activities, causing many violations of human rights. <coughs> this is what happened in Guatemala almost every day. Well, the economy of Guatemala is something that I also would like to show in, in, a, in very short. Uh, the Gini is one of the highest in Latin America, 55. And the income per capita is only $5,200 a year. Guatemala's population is about 15 million, but more than half of the population are indigenous and they are the ones more exposed to poverty and extreme poverty creating an environment of not only monetary inequality, but also racist, uh, racial issues. Many people consider Guatemala to be a poor country. I think it is not true. It is a country with lots of potential that has been plundered by terrible rulers, who usually become millionaires after being in power. Politicians usually get together in political parties to take advantage of the institutional weakness and promote corruption which has brought the country to the worst institu institutional crisis in its history. 
Public safety. Public safety is an issue of greatest concerns to Guatemala citizens and is the almost no family that has not been a victim of different type of violence. For me personally, it is extremely difficult to forget the day more than 10 years ago when I had planned to go to the beach for a long weekend. I had to stop at the bakery to buy bread. While I did, I left four of my kids in the car with a nanny. Suddenly, two men entered the bakery. One pointed a gun to the lady that sold the bread and the other approached me. He placed a gun in my stomach and asked me for the keys of my car. I had left the keys in the car. The engine was on, so I told him to get the key, my kids out of the car first and beg him not to hurt them. It was the most terrifying moment in my life. But I thank God that all my kids were saved and also the nanny, and it was only a bad incident. Many of the things that citizens in a country where there is freedom and peace can do normally are very risky situations in Guatemala. Routinary activities that you do as part of your normal life are there, life-threatening, like riding a bus, riding a bicycle, talking in the cell phone meanwhile you walk or meanwhile you're in the phone. It is common to see heavy armed guards in the streets, in supermarkets, in bakeries, pharmacies, movie theaters. There are more private guards than policemen in Guatemala. But this is another topic that I will not address today. Middle and upper class citizens live in close neighborhoods, like the ones we see here. Um, usually they live in close neighborhoods, close by high walls, bars, and razor wire that resembles more a ghetto than a neighborhood. The robbery of cell phones is an epidemic problem. Every member of my family has been assaulted at least once. Before my older son was 18 years old, he had been robbed three times at gunpoint in the middle of the day. In every case, the thieves were younger than him, and all they wanted was his cell phone. One of the most dangerous jobs in the country is to be a bus driver or a taxi driver, because the guns can kill you if you're not willing to pay the fee of extortion. If you're a user of the public transport, and happens to be in the bus, you also have a high chance to be assaulted. Let's look at the statistics. In our report about the violence in the human rights situation from January to June 2015, 131 persons related to the transport service have been killed. This is something to worry about. So there is no doubt that Guatemala is one of the most violent countries in the region. According to the United Nations, the Central American Northern Triangle is the worst, second most violent subregion behind South Africa. We cannot ignore that the country suffered an internal armed conflict that lasted 36 <coughs> years. The war left our region with a legacy of different structures that were built during the period to ensure impunity, corruption, and violence, and are still operating today. I do believe that all Guatemalans have wounds from the war. The Civil War ended in 1996 with the signature of the peace accords, but the agreements haven't been honored. So after almost 20 years of the signature of the peace, as a society, we have the same problems or worse than before the war that started more than 50 years ago. As a consequence of the violence and the lack of opportunities, thousands of people migrate to other countries looking to have a better life. Last year, the migration of kids without parents to the border of the United States was declared as an urgent humanitarian situation by President Barack Obama. <coughs> Being forced to leave your country is one of the most painful situations to face in life. For Guatemalans and many Hispanics, the ties to the family, the land, and their culture are very strong. When you decide to leave your community, you do it because there is no other choice. I think it is not easy to understand why a family would send their kids to a strange country facing any kind of threat in the journey. So maybe a story about a boy named Angel can help us understand what is happening in the Central American region. So I want you to, to meet Angel. Last July, 
Meanwhile, many Guatemalans were in the streets claiming the government to stop corruption and asking the president to resign. Angel was fighting for his life. A gang kidnapped Angel from his school. The day after, he was found at the bottom of a deep ravine. Incredible, he survived. He told his family that the gun wanted to force him to kill a bus driver as a rite of initiation. Angel was not a violent kid. Actually, he was a very good student. The gun members probably didn't know that Angel's father was a bus driver. Angel refused to kill anyone, so the gangster decided to kill him. But they gave him two options, either to be dismembered or thrown at the rabbit. He chose the last one. The day after he was found alive, but the story doesn't end here. The fireman that rescued him took him to a public hospital. As usual in Guatemala, there were no medicines. So his father had to go and buy medicine and sterilize water for the doctors to be able to cure his wounds. In the meantime, Angel died. As a Guatemala journalist pointed out, this 12-year-old boy was killed twice one by the violence and the other by a system marked by corruption. <clears throat> so maybe this can help us understand why the parents are willing to send their kids away, because this is what they're facing. As we all know, governments have certain obligations toward the citizens. Among these, they should guarantee security and justice for all. If the institutions that are in charge of this important task do not do their job, then the rule of law is an empty concept. <coughs> Guatemala is a clear example of a weak state where the correlation between corruption, weak institutions, impunity, and violence has a clear impact in human rights violations of different kinds. Since we live in an era of globalization and in many ways we are related, this affects other states as well. <coughs> Martin Luther King said that injustice any, anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I do believe that the words of Martin Luther King are true today. The effects of impunity and constant violation of human rights in one small country can affect the stability of its neighbors. According to our research, done by a foreign policy magazine, one of the three most important foreign policy issues facing the United States today is the issue of failure or failing states. Guatemala has a long history of good relations with, the na with many nations that have tried to help the country in different ways. For example, the sign of the peace agreement was possible thanks to the mediation of the international community. The European Union has spent millions of euros in different projects to help build better institutions. The United States has a program called the Central America Regional Security Initiative, known as CARSI. This program focuses on the rule of law promotion, police professionalization, and poverty reduction in Central America. But it seems that despite all the help that we have received, nothing has changed since 1980 when the program was launched. So in 2006, 10 years after the sign of the peace agreements, the violence claimed as much life as the civil war did. The high levels of impunity forced the Guatemalan government to ask the United Nations for help in the fight against corruption. So the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala was created. This is what the former Vice President Stein said. We realized that we couldn't fix our institution alone. We figured that if member states could ask the Security Council for peacekeepers, why not help the address an internal problem that is as serious as war, organized crime. This new institution from the United Nations, known as CSIG, was conceived as an independent body to support the Public Prosecutor Office the national police, and other state institutions in the investigation of <coughs> sensitive and difficult cases. The ultimate goal is that through CSIC work, national judicial sector institutions will be strengthened and be able to confront illegal groups and organized crime in the future. According to CSIC, there are certain things that the government of Guatemala has to do 
in order to build the capacity to fight against impunity and corruption. <coughs> One of those recommendations is the independence of judges. And that is something that I would like to tell you more about and share my personal experience in this matter. As a judge, I have always been protective of the judicial independence. I do believe that it is the keystone of any republican democratic system. I am also convinced that through the proper application of justice, most of our conflicts can be solved. And we as a community can achieve the freedom and peace that we all desire. But in Guatemala history, there has never been independence of the judiciary from other branches of power, the executive or the legislative. And nowadays, we have organized crime, corrupt politicians, and even law firms trying to influence the judiciary. So the goal to build a stronger institution and gain judicial independence is something that the judges have to build and insist on. On this regard, Stephen Breyer said that Ultimately, independence is a matter of custom, habitat, and institutional expectation. To build those custom habits and expectations require time and support, not only from the bench and bar, but from the communities where the judges serve. Unfortunately, it may prove easier to dismantle that independence than to obtain it. That is, that was the case during the tainted process of election from magistrates from the Appeals and Supreme Court last year in Guatemala. I think it's necessary to, to tell you that in my country there is a clear difference between being a judge and being a magistrate. A judge usually are appointed in the lower courts, which are called peace courts or first instance courts. They are named after a long process of selection by opposition. That requires the person to prove their knowledge, capacity, and ability to become a, lot, a judge. Then he or she will have to go to the School of Judicial Studies and be evaluated, previously to be appointed. But if a judge wants to become a magistrate for the appeal or Supreme Court, the process is totally different. First, the candidate has to go through a process of nomination by the nominating committees, better known as postulation commission. And then he or she will have to be elected by the Congress. Every five years, there are elections for magistrates. Many judges want to become magistrates, but everybody knows it is a high political process. And this is in the news, and, and everybody knows that the process is not something that, that is very clear. I have been a first instance judge for almost seven years and a substitute magistrate for two and wanted to continue in my position as a magistrate. Therefore, last year, I participated as a candidate to be reelected in the Courts of Appeals. During the last election, election of judges of higher courts, there were many claims of violation of the constitutional law. Different human rights organizations present complaints. More than 80 lawsuits for serious violations took place during the process. The commissioner from CSIC, Ivan Velasquez, spoke out against the process in this election. The special rapporteur of independence of judges and lawyers of the United Nations denounced that the process was against the basic principle of independence of the judiciary, approved by the UN. According to this principle, the qualification selection has to do a lot with, with selection and training. And I consider this subject very important, because instead of appointing the best candidates, those with the background, experience, and ability, the court selection process in Guatemala has become a political game. Therefore, what prevails is favoritism and the granting of privilege to individuals that lack values, principles, and moral ethics required to fulfill such a high-respected position. Furthermore, some of those who were appointed are generally connected to special interested groups and or to organize crime. As Justin Ruth Blader Gainsbourg said, judicial independence is vulnerable to assault. It can be shattered if the society law exists to serve, does not take, to, uh, does not take care to assure its preservation. For many judges of lower courts, it was clear that the whole process of election of judges in the higher courts was against the Constitution, and above all, a clear violation against the human right for a citizen to have an independent and impartial tribunal. Even though some of us had applied to become magistrates, we were convinced that the process was a fraud. 
organized by corrupt politicians, drug lords, and also unethical lawyers that were looking forward to take the judiciary under their control. For me, it was the end of our incipient democracy and the last step to become a failed state. I felt terribly disappointed, so I decided to formulate a legal opinion which clearly decayed interference with the judicial independence by interested groups and parallel powers. I always knew that this was dangerous and a very difficult battle, but it was worth not to try. I was the president of an organization of judges that promotes changes inside the judicial system called Instituto de la Judicatura. So I present a legal opinion to CICIG, to the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, and later to the Prosecutor of Human Rights in Guatemala, in order that his office could present a complaint at the Constitutional Court and override the whole process. But meanwhile, this happened suddenly on a Saturday afternoon, three days before the election of Courts of Appeals, I received a very weird message in my Facebook from a lawyer that I hardly remember. This is the copy of the message that I received that day. It said, hello, Claudia. I'm Vernon Eduardo Gonzalez. We studied together in the University of Francisco Marroquin. I need to talk about the issue of election of judges. It is urgent. My cell phone is. I was very suspicious of the message, but I decided to call him and agree to meet, along with Godofredo Rivera, a high-ranked congressman of the ruling party and former president of the Congress. During the meeting, I find out that Gonzalez was the attorney of the vice president, Roxana Valdetti, and that they had presented a petition in the court where I serve. In Guatemala, it is constitutional for government officials to hold positions with the political parties but they wanted the court to allow the vice president to serve as a secretary of the official party. The attorney of the vice president, Bernard Gonzalez, and Congressman Rivera offered me to be elected as a magistrate in exchange for a favorable ruling to the vice president. The congressman <coughs> clearly said, you know that in this process, it doesn't matter your experience, your background, your knowledge. All it counts is who do you know? And now you have the chance to have good friends in Congress. We can help you to be elected, but you need to give us this resolution in favor of the Vice President. I was in shock. The 30 minutes that the meeting lasted. I knew I was not going to give the resolution, but I didn't know how to react. I knew it was going to be the end of my career, and I was terribly nervous because I was recording the conversation without them knowing. At the end, I denied the petition on Monday, September 29, 2014. Next day, the Congress voted to elect me as a magistrate for the appeal courts. But I could not accept the post knowing that the whole process was a scam. Then I took the time to talk to some judges that were elected as magistrates. I tried to convince them to resign with me, but they didn't want to. Some of them were afraid of the consequences and others prefer to have their job secure. I decided to resign as an elected magistrate and remain as a judge in the lower courts. When I did, I publicly denounced all the flaws in the process of election. Later, a group of more, of more than 80 judges backed back me up, and we all asked the Constitutional Court to void the process. However, the judges who support the claim immediately received retaliation, and the newly, the newly elected magistrate put pressure on them to dissuade them. This pressure were in the form of threats and dismissal and review supervision by the administrative organs of the judiciary in order to discharge them. In the meantime, the high officials of governments, the president, the vice president, and many of the leaders of the political parties in public declarations refute my statement and ask for proofs. This was a clear interference with the dependence of the judiciary. They didn't knew at that time that I also made a complaint before CICIG against the lawyer Gonzalez and the congressman Rivera on charges of inf influence pending and bribery. Along with the complaint, I submitted the recording of the conversation and the offers of those involved. Three days. After I resigned, Guatemala Constitutional, Constitutional Court decided to temporarily suspend the swearing of the judges of the Supreme Court and the Chamber of Appeals elected for the period 
2014-2019. All members of the Institute of the Judiciary made every effort we could to ensure that Guatemala citizens and the international community knew what was going on in the justice system. We went to radio, television programs, organized forums, interviews, and talks. The media covered this issue abundantly. At the international level, we denounced the serious event that threatened the democratic system in our country. We wanted the world to know because we desperately needed help to save our small but beautiful country from corruption and impunity. I was able to go to Europe. In Brussels, I talked to officials of the European Commission and also met with, with human rights defenders. In Geneva, I went to the office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, the office of the Rapporteur of Judicial Dependence. We also went to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights of the Organization of the American States in Washington to fill a complaint of violation of judicial independence. However, no effort was enough. Given the influence of the powers that control the appointment of Congress, 40 days after the Constitutional Court decided to suspend the election, the court issued a final ruling that the allegations were unfounded and the court selected should take office. When I realized that there was nothing else to do against the process of election of courts, I decided I was going to go back to my post in the lower courts and do my best as a judge. I was aware that the Supreme Court magistrates were not happy with everything that had happened, but hoped that they understood it was a battle about ethical principles and not a personal remark against them. I was totally wrong. They were absolutely offended. They were ready to destroy my judicial career. First, they didn't recognize, they didn't want to recognize my position as a judge. I had to present a claim. The prosecutor of human rights of Guatemala had to intervene, and finally, they allowed me to go back to my court. Then they sent the supervision to my judiciary and pressured all the officials to press charges against me with no reason. This is when I realized that my actions and denunciation has placed me, my family and me in a high risk situation. Not only my professional career was at risk but I also was advised that our physical integrity was in jeopardy because I made clear evidence that the interference of the executive and the legislative power in the election of high judicial officials and had also noted further infiltration of the parallel powers and organized crime in the judicial system. The case of election of the judges was an alarm that all government institutions in Guatemala were infiltrated by organized crime and also was a precedent for what happened later when CICIC what made, made public the investigation about corruption in the executive and in the legislative branch. The work of the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala under the direction of Commissioner Ivan Velasquez has been a key player in the history of justice in Guatemala. Believe me, Ivan Velasquez is a superhero for Guatemalans. <laughs> <laughs> he is. And he also has a great recognition in international level. Yesterday, the foreign policy magazine recognized him as one of the most influential persons in the world. From April to August, different cases of corruption were made public after CICIC investigations. It was clear that the most powerful and influential politicians were involved. Institutional weakness in Guatemala and non-fulfillment of duty by public officials have caused a constant violation of human rights for Guatemalans. The current crisis is the result of many years of abuse by political and legal system incapable of proving peace and justice. Through the investigations carried out by CICIC, it has been evident why politicians and other interested groups manipulated the election of judges. They discovered the relation between the group of lawyers known as a legal firm for impunity and its link with judges. And here we have how, how this structure works. This picture here is from a judge, and this is the structure that they discovered that was in the scan. And well, these are the, the lawyers, and these are the, the ones that are involved. And this is a picture of a Supreme Court judge, magistrate that was elected. And this is the structure. His son is involved in one of the structures. He's a nephew in another one, and this lady is the same that was before here, and she is her sister-in-law. So it's all tight. 
Okay, so this led to a national awakening unprecedented in the country. Citizens from different sectors forgot their difference and peacefully and spontaneously took the streets to express the rejection of corruption and demand justice. For more than eight months, every Saturday, the Central Park of Guatemala City was crowded with my families. I'm gonna show you a video. It was crowded by families, students, human rights defenders, entrepreneurs, among others. And all of them, and all of them were demanding for a change through peaceful protests. que hace unos momentos he sido notificado de la renuncia por parte de la señora vicepresidenta Ingrid Roxana Valdetti de Lima.
So in August, CC reported that according to the investigation, the structure of the case of custom fraud, known as La Línea, was also directed by the President of the Republic, General Otto Perez Molina. That created a national strike in August 17, the first of the process in a weekday, where businesses, schools, universities, and factories were shut down. Eventually, on September the 2nd, the Congress lifted impeachment and leave no immunity to the president, so he was forced to resign. Hours later, he was sent to jail. So now, it is up to the justice system to demonstrate that it has the ability to solve these problems. Some judges of the first instance court are, we no doubt, committed to justice and to promote the rule of law. But what will happen with the magistrates that were elected last year? Will the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court step away from their groups, or will they answer to the so-called telephone justice system? The one that occurs when the party boss calls the judges and tells them how to decide the outcome of a particular case, as explained by Stephen Breyer regarding the judicial system in Russia. CC Commissioner Ivan Velasquez has repeatedly said, the efforts from CC and the public ministry to combat corruption and to help the country won't help if the judiciary doesn't assume its historical responsibility. The fight against corruption is a fight that involves the society as a whole. Many years ago, Edmund Burke said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That means that apathy is the enemy of justice. But we do not want Guatemala or any other country to be a failed state. I am optimistic, and I believe that good Guatemala citizens will stand to make that large-scale changes that need to be done so we can hope for a better future. Okay. Thank you.